Good morning, happy Sabbath, everyone. I hope that everyone's had a great week, and I thank the Lord that we remain safe throughout the week and that we are here together to worship. I want to welcome each and every one here to you, every, each and every one of you here today, and I hope you have a blessed Sabbath. Now let us stand for our opening song, number 416, The Judgment Has Set. church. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. The scripture reading is taken from Genesis 37 verse 19 and it reads, and they said one to another, behold, the dreamer cometh. Amen. Happy Sabbath church in the morning. Now I'll be doing prayer. Please kneel or close your eyes and Bow your head if you can.
Dear Lord, dear forgiving Father, we come to you with grace and forgiveness. We thank you for all the sins you have paid for us. Although we are undeserving, you still give us a chance to be here today to worship your holy name. And we continue to praise you and thank you for that blessing that you have gave us, that we are able to stand here today in your presence and glorify you. That's so amazing. We thank you for protecting us during these past few weeks, months, years with this trouble and child tri tribulations with this corona and all these things that's happening around us. But you are here to comfort us and cover us with your, with your love and compassion. And we, are, we thank you for that, Lord. And please help us to remain focused and have our sight on only you and not fall into temptation, but to remain focused on you only, you and you only. Lord, we thank you for everything I've done for us. Help us to learn more about you today and leave here, leave, the, leave your church with more knowledge to share with other people, to gain more souls for you and your, your purpose only. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, good morning, Sabbath School. We're glad to see everybody here this morning. Amen. Yeah, last week was kind of thin, but we understand why. You got your sleep and my turn is coming. My turn is coming. So I'm glad to see you here. Um, that's my glasses. I lost my regular glasses sometime this week, so I'm gonna have to be pulling on and off these. Thank God for uh, what you call them glasses you buy at Walmart, reading glasses. Because so I'll be messed up. So, uh, all right. This week, the drama continues from last week that Brother Mike uh, told us about, with, uh, told us about with Jacob and Esau and the night of wrestling with the angel, which was Jesus. So now we're gonna move on to Joseph. Joseph, the master of dreams. All right, and the memory verse is, and I added 18 too, it's it, eight, seven, rather than 17. I want you to get the whole context of the memory verse. It says, and when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, behold, this dream are coming. And that's found, of course, in Genesis 37, 18, and 19. It says here in the introduction, the story of Joseph covers the last section of the book of Genesis, from his first dream in Canaan to the, his death in Egypt. In fact, Joseph occupies more space in the book of Genesis than any other patriarch. Although Joseph is just one of Jacob's son, he is presented in Genesis as a great patriarch like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. As we will see, too, the life of Joseph highlights two important theological truths. First, God fulfills his promises. Second, God can turn evil into good. In this week's lesson, in this week's study, we will focus on the early life of Joseph. He is Jacob's favorite son. So we're beginning the beginning, we're beginning the first week of two weeks on Joseph. And then next week it'll be more of when he's in Egypt and what he and what he does in Egypt. Okay? So the last thing I've read was 
In this week's study, we will focus on the early life of Joseph. He is Jacob's favorite son, which leads us to Sunday's lesson, Family Troubles. All right? And this lesson, which I try to do with all lessons, has, has application for us today. We're just not reading a story just to read a story. This is applicable for us today to help us in our lives. It says here, Jacob has at last settled in the land. Yet it was then, as he was settling in the land, that the troubles began, this time from inside the family. The controversy does not concern the possession of the land or the use of a well. It is mainly spiritual. Um, Brother Emmanuel, can you do me a favor? Or oh, Brother Desna, there's a mic right here. All right, so if you have a question, just raise your hand and Brother, Brother Desnot will bring you the microphone, okay? All right, the question is, what family dynamic predisposed Joseph's brothers to hate him so much? What did, what happened, what happened so to get to the point with, where Joseph's brothers just hated him to death? This is an intriguing story. I mean, I. I've read this story a thousand times, and every time I study it, you know, something else talks to me and, and, and brings out, you know, something, and I'm like, man. All right? First, let's go to Genesis 37, and I have it up on the screen, but we're just going to read verses 2 to 4, because we don't have time to really read everything. And it says, and we're going to take our time, Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And Joseph brought a bad report. So we'll stop right there. Joseph, as, as the Sabbath school lesson brought out, Joseph was a snitch. And if, and if anybody had a big family, you know nobody likes a snitch in a family. Nobody likes a snitch in a crew, wherever you go. And Joseph would go back, everything that happened, he would go back and tell his father. All right, so you can see why all of a sudden they're like, listen, they picked him out as, okay, you the one, you the snitch, and they started to really hate him, all right? Let's move on. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. All right? Number two. That should never happen. And I'm going to read a commentary on that. Joseph loved, I mean, sorry, Jacob loved Joseph more than the rest of his children. All right? And we got to understand that we shouldn't do that because a lot of times that'll have an effect later on in life on the children. Because I've seen it happen. All right? We ought to treat all of our children the best that we can evenly as far as possible. But what Joseph did, he just went to the extreme. Because if we read on, also he made him a tunic of many colors. And I'll come back to that. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peace, peaceably to him. So on top of him being a snitch on his brothers, on top of his father showing more love for Joseph, he's going to go buy him a coat of many colors. And, and the problem is you don't get nobody else one. And you, you know you can't do that. I remember one time when I was a kid, for some reason, I didn't go out, but my mother went out and took all the rest of us. We have, I have four siblings, and they all came back with ice cream cones. And I didn't have one, and I remember I went in the room and cried because it wasn't fair. You're going to buy everybody else an ice cream cone. You don't remember me, and so I felt left out. So you could imagine, okay, how the brothers was feeling right now. Okay, they, they was like, this ain't going to work, all right? Um, so, so, so as parents, we have to try not to play favorites. You know, sometimes we see children, some of them may be smarter than others, and some of them maybe take the initiative to do the chores, of, you know, and, you know, but we shouldn't take that as love, more love toward that person, all right? We show love and try to help those 
you know, if the other son or daughter need more help in math, take your time and show love toward that. But don't start to, to you know, to build up, your, this is my favorite child, this is my favorite child, because it's wrong, and again, it'll come back later on in life, and I'll explain that in a minute, okay? Um, it says here, from the very beginning, we understand that Joseph, the son of Jacob's old age, enjoyed a special relationship with his father, who loved him more than all his brothers. Jacob even went so far as to make Joseph a tunic of many colors, which is called a prince garment in 2 Samuel 13, 18 an indication of Jacob's secret intention to elevate Joseph's, Joseph, Rachel's first son, to the status of firstborn. So Jacob had an agenda. He wanted to put Joseph before everybody. Birthright, everything, all right? And that was wrong. It says here, Jacob unwisely gave expression to his love for Joseph in making him a present of a coat of beautiful colors. See, the spirit of prophecy, it was unwise. This only increased the hatred of his brothers against him, for they thought Joseph had stolen their father's affection from them, and they considered themselves ill-treated and deprived of their father's confidence and love. So it shows here, Jacob was not wise, okay, in doing this. And I can't emphasize more how we cannot do this, all right? But what was really, why, why, what was really behind Jacob and Joseph? We know that, like it said, he loved Joseph more. But what was really behind it? Really, really behind it. It says here, Signs of the Times, of the 12 sons of Jacob, the one for whom he had special love was Joseph, for he was the son of his beloved wife, Rachel. All right, so that's, that's where the trouble began. Actually, it's gonna go back, I'm gonna show you shot up, but that's where it began. He loved him some Rachel. And when he finally had a son from Rachel, he, he, he took that child like it was the only child. And he loved that child more than the rest of them, okay? There was continuous strife among the 11. The envy and the jealousy which were cherished by the several mothers, making the family relation very unhappy, were instilled by word and example into the minds and hearts of the children, who grew up revengeful, jealous, and uncontrollable. These evils will never be found to be, these evils will ever be found to be the result of polygamy. And there's some people that use these stories to justify polygamy, you all know that? They say, oh man, Jacob had and, and Isaac did it, but these people had trouble in their family. Jacob should have never, and I'm sorry, yes, Jacob should have never married Rachel. In God's eyes, Leah was his wife. That's why the line of Jesus came through Leah. So now, if Jacob loved Rachel, why did God allow this to happen? Why, if Jacob, Jacob was a good man, he just, you know, sinful like all of us. So why, if he knew that Jacob loved Rachel, why did he allow this deception to happen? All right? You know, the Bible says, what you sow, you will reap. All right? Remember the story before this, that Jacob and his mother deceived Esau out the birthright. And God said, okay, you want to deceive, now you're going to be deceived. All right? but he should have never married Rachel because it was polygamy. It was a heathen thing that they did. Uh, right, right in back here, Brother Desnard, Brother, Brother Blackwood. He could have denied the marriage of, he could have denied the marriage of, of Leah, you know? Yes, he could have. If he had denied the marriage of Leah, he could have married Rachel. Great point. That's so right. Remember now, the yep. reason why that happened was because it would be a disgrace to the family. Right. Right. Amen. He didn't have to marry Leah. So, but, but the deception was not on his line. Mm -hmm. And remember, although he, he, he was a deceiver, God had nothing to do with the deception that 
that took place with him. Right. No, I understand. Yep, that's right. He allowed it to happen. You reap what you sow. Amen. But he did not have to. If he would have waited, God would have probably let him have Rachel. And the line would have came through Rachel. Okay, but he did it. You know, you know, I say love blind. He got discombobulated his mind, and he and he knew better. All right, he knew better. Love was binding. Um, let me see. Uh, you know, people say, especially the Roman Church, they say that Jesus, when he came, he came divine because Mary was divine. And Jesus had no sin in him or anything like this. All right? But I'm going to tell you, and as we go, I'm not going to get to that story today, but when, at my, on Wednesday lesson, we talk about Tamar, who played a prostitute. The line of Jesus had a whole bunch of deceit, lying, cheating, adultery, all that stuff. So Jesus had human blood. He had a propensity to sin, but he did not. He came in flesh and blood. The line of Christ will show you. And I studied it this week. I don't have time to go through it. There's all kind of people in there. Rahab and Tamar and, and all these polygamists and all these people. All right? We always look at one side of the Immaculate Conception where she didn't get pregnant by a man but by the Holy Spirit. But we don't look at the other side showing that the line was real blood. Sinful, real blood that flowed through Jesus' body, but he did not sin. All right? But you see what it did. You see what polygamy did. It brought revenge, jealousy, uncontrolled. It was un out of control. All because, and then not only this, you know that each of them, each of the wives gave each of their handmaidens to Jacob as well. All right? Because if you read the story, one, then Leah couldn't have kids, and she got jealous because... Uh, Rachel gave her builder to have because she couldn't have it, and then Zephyrah, it was, it's just messed up. And so it's amazing how the children of Israel, God's people, came out of a bunch of polygamy and adultery. I mean, isn't that amazing? It shows you, and God allows it to show us that there is nothing he cannot do. In the beginning, it says, uh, when we read in the introduction, God can turn good, evil into good anytime. We may suffer the consequences. Right? But he can change anything. When this church was started in 1844, well, sorry, it, it started, but it was officially in 1863, right? We came out of something called the Great Disappointment. The, name, the word disappointment is not a great word. But God's people came out of a great disappointment. God's people came out of four women. But the line of Christ came through the wife that God acknowledged, Leah, all right? So just to get that up through our heads. Okay, it says here, and any more questions, just raise your hand. So when Joseph shared his dreams, well, before we get to that, so now, right now we're to the point where, you know, he was a snitch. He, uh, I'm coming to you, he was a snitch. His father loved him more because of Rachel. Father brought him a coat of many colors. All right? There was jealousy because there was so many mothers. So the brothers was kind of messed up, right? But they hated Joseph. If I go to the next brother, brother uh, Desnot. Oh, you got the mic already. Go ahead. My question is, the Bible shows that the line, the, the line of Christ comes through the male, not the female. Right. No, it does. I mean, it does come to the male, but what I'm saying is that with the woman part, if you read the line, it always says male. And then it'll have the, lot, the wives, some of the wives there, but it always comes through the male. That's right. But it did come, you know, the, the line was born through Leah. Go ahead. Yes, I will affirm that it was born through Leah because if you look at um, Genesis chapter 49, where Jacob was prophesying about his children, uh, future prosperity. Mm -hmm. If you look at um, Judah, it says, I, you shall shallow come. Mm -hmm. And shallow here is speaking about the Prince of Peace. And who is the Prince of Peace? And that is Christ. Right. So Christ came out of the line of Judah, and Judah was a descendant of Leah. Okay, thank you. 
Yep. All right. So now, if it, if it couldn't get worse than that, it gets worse. All right? Genesis 37, 7 to 9. So then Joseph had a dream. And, and, and like I said, the story just gets worse and worse because you're like, you really? Can you imagine the brothers? What they think? And then Joseph had a dream and he comes to the brothers and tell them that there were binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheep arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaves. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. So can you imagine? First he told it he saw the dream with the sheaves, and that was about his brother, and then he had the one with the sun, moon, and star, which represented his mother and father. So everybody, Joseph is saying, everybody's gonna be bowing to me. Now, in the lesson it brings out the spirit of prophecy that Jacob, he, 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 he contemplated this because he knew God was in this somewhere, so he did not run up and get mad and get mad and upset like the brothers. But this was the last straw with the brothers, okay? I mean, you, they, they just couldn't take no more. And I, and I just put myself in that position. If these things are happening, in a way you gotta be like, you know, and it all stemmed from Jacob, Joseph Jacob, loving this son more, all right? So, yes, we're not exonerating the brothers how they're feeling, but Jacob should have never, ever showed so much favor toward his son like that, all right? And his brothers said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us, or shall you indeed have dominion over us, so that they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words? And I'll come right to you. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream, and this dream, the sun, moon, and the, sun the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream? that you have dreamed. Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him. I'll speak, yeah, sister, sister, um. God is the one that gives dream, but my question is, although it is a dream, is it every time you should share a dream? Should we, you ask asking, should we, if we, if we have a dream, should we share it all the time? Uh-huh. No, I, I say no. I think that, listen, it's like studying. Sometimes when I'm studying, I get deep studying. And the things that God shows me, and I think it's right, that I can't come before the church. Because they're going to think, they're going to think things. If that, has it ever happened to anybody? You run across something... And you're like, whoa. But you know the church ain't ready for it. And we cannot just go and just come and, and try to change everything. We have to wait for God. All right? A lot of people are messed up. There's a lot of religions now. There's a lot of different things because people went with what they thought. So I say, you know, if God told you something, I don't, you know what, I would share it with somebody. And then if that's somebody said, you know what, maybe we should go talk to the pastor, something like that, I would do that, all right? But as far as some people take a dream and they come here, and I know people who take dreams and all of a sudden they turn it on everybody else. God showed me that this person is this, and God showed me that this person is that, and God said this and that, and, and God could be talking about you. Up, oh, Brother uh, Samuel. That is a dream. You could share that to people. There is a dream God gives you. Don't share that with no one. Right. Uh, about the children, as a father mm -hmm. and mother, mm -hmm. never show one of them you love you that one, more than you that one. Right. That happened a lot, and a lot of lot of children kill children because the mother and father show the other one more love. Mm -hmm. They don't tell you what's going on, mm -hmm. but in the future mm -hmm. something will be happen. Mm -hmm. You always never show you love one more than the other one. Right. Now, I believe he was convicted 
to tell that to, to go back to the brothers because this is the providence of God that was being played out. Okay, uh, you want to say that? I would say concerned like dreams. Not every dream you should tell somebody. Mm -hmm. That's like not everything in your past you should relate to someone else. Because mm -hmm. that's why it says even in marriage covenant, there are certain things you can't reveal to your husband or your wife. So even with, like for example, with um, Joseph, not Joseph of uh, times of Pharaoh, them, but talking about Joseph, the who was to be the father, quote unquote, of Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, when he had a dream about not to return to, uh, not to go to, I believe it was Nazareth or something like that, not to go um, because they want to kill the child. He, he did not relate that dream to nobody, nobody else. Right. So we are used as Christian. Right. Um, when we um, try and tell people. Um, things that God revealed to us. Right. I, I think God would let us know if we need to go say something. You know, listen, I, I, I had a dream about the East Coast was wiped out by a tsunami about two years ago. But I don't come here saying, listen, we need to blah, 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 and the tsunami's coming. Because also, I've watched a lot of stuff over the years. We don't understand the mind. You know that. And there's a lot of things we put in our mind over the years that just comes back. The mind is complex, and it could mean nothing. Right? But if you go on YouTube, you see people, you just put dreams, and everybody's coming on there about their dreams and what it means. And I saw a tsunami, and I saw an earthquake in St. Petersburg and in California and all these things like that. But what I'm saying is that we don't need to go that far. We see that the end is near. Just get your life right. And no matter what happens, you'll be ready whether you, whether you die or you live. Okay? We know these things are going to happen. You don't have to predict that to me because I believe it's going to happen anyway. I'm not saying a tsunami in the East Coast, but I'm just saying we're going to see some horrible, terrible things. All right? But, you know, dreams, most dreams are about nothing. And don't forget, the devil has the, the, devil has the ability to put stuff in your mind too. So we have to be sure that it's from God. All right, and I believe he would give us some kind of conviction to be like, you know what, go here. Especially in the world today where there's so much uh, 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 deception going on, you know, and so much people in our churches coming with dreams. But this was God's providence being worked out, you know. So it's something you just got to pray about. And, you know, if I have a, a crazy dream, I'll talk, I'll talk, first thing I'll talk to my wife. And then, you know, and I'll go from there. All right, I hope I answer that or we answer that or whatever have you so okay let's let's move on um uh so jacob was upset and they all all of them was upset right here all right they couldn't believe this this guy this guy is coming to us and and gonna tell us something like this which leads us to the attack on joseph monday's lesson we're not gonna get through this lesson because it's, it's so much in this lesson that they should have broke this up in like three lessons but it says here, uh, Genesis 37, 12, 30, 12 to 36. What does this teach us about how dangerous and evil unregenerate hearts can be and what they can lead any one of us to do? And I just did verse 8 and 9. It says, uh, 18 to 19, I'm sorry. Now, when they saw him afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. Then they said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit. And we shall say some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. And you know what? You get chilled because you know what happened at the end of the story. All this comes back on them. But I can't mess up somebody's who was doing Sabbath school next week. But you know what I'm just telling you, brothers and sisters, that, and, and it's sorry to say, but some of the worst people and your worst enemies can come from inside of your family. I mean, we, we, we look at work, and we go and look at our friends, but some of the most evil people is inside of your family, all right? And guess what? It won't manifest itself until somebody dies. And then you'll see all kind of stuff. I saw it with my own eyes, and I could not believe it. I could not believe the change that came over. You'll never know. You know, you know people say you can't trust nobody. 
Sometimes that's true. You have to know, and some people you think you know. For years you know people, for years. But like the Bible says, nobody knows the heart. And there's greed in people's heart, all right? And it takes a death to germinate that greed. You understand what I'm saying? There's a saying that money changes people. You ever heard that? Okay, money doesn't change people. You know what money does? Money just brings to fruition what was already in you, greed. So when the money comes, you are ready to do whatever you're gonna do. So that spirit has been inside of you all that time, but it was just nothing to bring it out, all right? And a lot of times that happened in families, okay? And it's, and it's really a shame. Somebody recently just died and it's happening in their family. And I'm like, oh my goodness. So here, these brothers get to the point where they want to kill him. I mean, I got mad at my brother. I mean, I said plenty of times we got mad at him, but we, hey, we came nowhere close to saying, I want to kill you. But this hate was really in these guys. But Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit, which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him. So Judah said to his brothers, what profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let us not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother in our flesh. And his brothers listened. Now don't that sound kind of stupid? After all they planned on doing to him, they said, but he is our brother and our flesh. Now, they already killed him because the Bible said when you're angry with somebody, you, you, you commit murder unjustly, okay? There is a righteous anger, a righteous indignation. Go ahead before I go on. Brother Jim. But if you look at, sorry, but if you look at where that anger stemmed from, I think you addressed it uh, a bit earlier. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was something that was conceived even in their inception. Because right. you had two families warring, the, the Leah and, and Rachel. Mm -hmm. Each of them was con constantly uh, com competing with one another, mm -hmm. which one to be loved the most. Right. That so that, 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 that um, energy, that um, uh, feelings that was fair to those children in Leah were um, warm. Right. You understand? So when, that, when those children were born they, and they had seen all that taking place within the family, it just naturally happens that they begin to hate Leah's, I mean, Rachel's children. Right. You understand? So, yep. we have, like you said earlier, we have to be careful how we, even in that when a uh, mother is pregnant, what kind of emotion you allow to, uh, to, to entertain your mind. Right. But you know what? That goes back to the, grand, the grandfather and the great-grandfather. Abraham married Sarah, then he married Hagar, but he showed favor towards Sarah and her kids, and Hagar got mad, right? And I mean, and it just, it just, it just keep happening. Rebecca loved Jacob, and his father loved Esau. So this divide was just there, this jealousy, this, this, uh, what do you call it, not jealousy, um, favoritism was there through the whole family. Deceiving, lying, deception, it, it was just there. And, but, but it does say that it is because, besides Isaac, there's a lot had to do with the polygamy. That brought a lot of the jealousy and the hate among the wives, among the concubines, among the sons. That was, that was the bottom line. That should have never happened, all right? And, and like I said, a lot of people think, they look at this thing happening in the Bible because God really never comes and put his foot down and condemned it and, and you know what I mean? But we know it's wrong if you read the Bible. It's under the seventh commandment, all right? But people think that it's okay. I think that's where the Mormons get this from. They think it's okay to have two, three, four wives because you go back to that. The children of Israel came out of them. There's nothing wrong with that. It is. It'll cause jealousy. Let me tell you something. If you're married, if, if you're a man in hand married, and another woman just look at you the wrong way, your wife is going to bring it up to you. So how on earth can you live with two women? Do you understand what I'm saying? It's going to be jealousy. I don't care how much you say no, it's not. Sooner or later, 
something's gonna happen. And like I always said, if it doesn't happen then, wait till the children are born. Because the children will open up everybody's eyes. It will. Now, my, in my former marriage, I was married to a non-believer, and everything was fine. Everything was wonderful. I was gonna, I was gonna, I was, I was gonna do the Solomon thing, try to convert her. And everything was fine until the children was born. And then all of a sudden, I wanted to go to church on Sabbath, and all of a sudden she was like, but there's a party tonight. I'm taking, and I'm like, but I thought that we, I thought, and everything started going away. So again, it starts at home, and what we do as parents, that's gonna trickle down to our children. And that's what's happening here. Okay, it says here, yes sir, yes sir brother, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, I didn't see you. So this story, and we have example from in Joseph and Jacob, but this kind of example we have today, my coming, mm -hmm. and um, when you was a Christian, something can be happen to you. God will be come with you. Right. And uh, God will be f f uh, come to Abraham and Jacob, mm -hmm. and Joseph. Mm -hmm. If he not uh, abandon these people, I think we are example to get some coming mm -hmm. when God, when you have an in situation. Whatever bad situation, God will be come with you. That's right. Sometimes he, he lets you to, That's right. to do something. Right. He just look at you. Right. But yeah. God will become you with you. That's right. Anyway. Some, right. So, Sometimes the providence of God is working and we have no idea it's working. Things are happening because God is allowed to happen because his, his providence is his will. And sometimes we stop his will because we don't understand we stop his will and we deter our lives to try to keep our logic and, and God is like saying no. Because you see, Joseph, I always say, Job to me suffered the most in the Bible, human, besides Jesus, okay? But then after that, Jacob, I mean, Joseph went through a lot, but he kept the faith. I don't know how he did that. He kept the faith through everything. And we still, and, and half of the story still ain't even told that he's gone. He, he hasn't even been in prison yet, which we get into right now, okay? It says here, it's hard to imagine the kind of hatred expressed here, especially for someone of their own household. How could these young men have done something so cruel? Did they not think even for a moment about how this would impact, impact their father? Whatever resentment they might have had toward their father because, of favor, because he favored Joseph, to do this to one of his children was truly despicable. What a powerful manifestation of just how evil human beings can be. And it, and it says, what about them thinking about Jacob? What about God? I mean, they were brought up the right way. Nobody thought about God and how God was feeling about this. It says at the bottom, why is it so important to seek God's power in order to change bad traits of character before they can manifest themselves in acts that at one point in your life, you would never have imagined yourself doing. In other words, brother, jealousy, hate, malice, when right, it'll turn to evil deeds, revenge, avenge, and murder by mouth. And that's what happens. Sometimes we get 40, 50, and 60 and think that we don't need to change. We have developed characters when we was younger, you know, 18, 20s, and all stuff like that. And then you ever heard a person say, well, that's, that's me, I'm not changing. That's the wrong attitude. We are learning until we die. We are changing until we die or Jesus comes. There's no such thing as that we're there. We've arrived, you made it, okay? Bible said, take heed lest ye fall, all right? So, you know, if we see these jealousies and hate and stuff that's in us, we have to remove it. Somehow we have to remove it. If you have malice against somebody, you're gonna have to go and make peace. 
Now, if that person doesn't want to do it, okay. But you, you just can't sit and do nothing and expect when Jesus to come, you're going to heaven because you're not. We're not. We have to make peace and, and change these traits. And I know a lot of these, especially jealousy, follows children as they come up. And sometimes when they get older, they peck at each other, because I've seen that too. Because of jealousy that happened when they was younger. All right, if you're a part of a family like that, you need to pray and ask God to change you so that you don't feel that way no more. And just call your brothers and sisters and say you love them. Okay? There's no such thing as, you know, I, I can't change or I'm like that. If, you, if you're not, if we're not in the character of Christ, then we can be changed. Okay? And listen, if you're in the character of Christ and you're not, in, and you're not uh, uh, careful, you can change again and go back for the worse. So we have to keep Christ ever before us in our minds, reading and studying and praying. Right, right quick, I got five minutes, I want to get to this. Joseph as a slave. It says here, in light of the example of Joseph's working as a man, manager under Potiphar, what are some of the factors that led to such success? And I'm going to read a couple right quick. He said, the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian, and his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house and all that he put under his authority. He prospered only because he kept the Lord with him. That's it. We will always prosper, and it, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to be money. Okay? God will prosper that you notice you don't have a, you ever, you ever, you ever paid all your bills and you have no money left? But guess what? All your bills are paid, but you're dead broke. Okay? You prospered. All right? But we always look at prospering as having a pocket full of money and a bank account. Three cars and a, and a, and a six-bedroom house. That's, that's not prospering. If God is not with you, it's not prospering. Okay? Because sooner or later, it's going to disappear. Okay? It says here, I'm going to finish this five more minutes. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and in appearance, and it came to pass after these things that his master's wife casting longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? You see what Joseph did? Joseph did what Jacob couldn't do. Because when Jacob came to marry Rachel, he should have said that same thing. I can't do this wickedness. Joseph did it. This man needs to be studied by all men. Okay? But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was inside that she caught him by his garment, saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran out. And I'm, and I'm going to be truthful. There's times in my life where I couldn't do that. I mean, listen, Adam, Abraham, Jacob, Samson, Solomon, David could not run. They all gave in. Women had something to do with their downfall. And we're talking about the wisest man that ever lived the strongest man that ever lived, the most perfect man that ever lived, one of the greatest kings that ever lived, and all of them. So what does this tell us? Joseph had the spirit of God. And by the way, Potiphar's wife was a good-looking woman. Okay? And it all could have just went away. He could have slept with her. She would have been like, okay, he could have still been in the house. But he gave up all of that. He gave up everything because he wanted to stay righteous and true to God. After all he'd been through, okay, it says here, I got three more minutes. Um, Joseph experiences here what we all have experienced, the sense of abandonment by God, though even in this difficult time, the Lord was with him. From the beginning, Joseph never lose trust in God. He went from the pit to prison. There's a saying I wrote down. 
that I heard last night. It says, every setback is a setup for a comeback. Or you can add a word and say, every earthly setback is a setup for a divine comeback. So anything that happens to us, brothers and sisters, if we believe in Christ and we're doing the best we can to serve him, when bad things happen, we should know the providence of God is being worked out. No matter how bad, your son or daughter may die. You may lose everything you have. Your husband or wife may die. God knows what he's doing. We cannot lose it. All right? I understand, you know, we mourn, get over it, get up, and praise God. Because he knows what he's doing. And Joseph, I don't know if he knew what God was doing. I don't think so. But he knew God was in charge. Okay? He knew God was in charge. And that's one thing Jacob taught his son, which he didn't teach. And that's another thing. He didn't teach his other sons like he taught Joseph. So that's why his other sons were sort of messed up. But he sat Joseph down and taught him. And Joseph knew. And all of this is the providence of God working because God knew what Joseph was going to do. One more minute. Is Tiana's in here? Okay. Okay, I see her. <laughs> One more minute. So it says here, in closing, um, how can we learn to trust God and cling to his promises when events don't appear providential at all and indeed God seems silent? We have to understand that a lot of times things are going to get worse before it gets better. When I came back out of the world into the church, I just thought, okay, I gave my heart, and I was serious, and God knew. I gave my heart to him. I said, I give up. He took everything. One by one, he just took everything. And, I said, and he knew. I came, and then I thought it was going to get better. It got worse. For the next six months, it was the worst six months in the world. But then after that six months, things got better. Because see, sometimes God has to see if we're really in it for him or we're in it for ourselves. As soon as he delivers us, we're going to leave him. So he, sometimes you heard the saying, he got to keep us on our knees a little bit longer to see where, we come, where, where we're coming from. Are we serious in what we're doing? Okay? And he saw then I was serious because I wouldn't, he's the only person I, had, I would not leave him. I guess in a way that was my night of wrestling with him because I would not let him go. I, I, was, I, I had it. I lost everything. I couldn't do nothing. I told you, I'm a hustler. And when it gets to the point where I couldn't hustle no more, and God made it that way, that I couldn't do it no more. And I said, okay, you win. So I have to stop now. Man. Okay, I have to stop now. I have to stop now. So, okay. But um, next week, it's going to be continued when he's in Egypt. I hope, you know, we got something out of this. And, and read, it, read the lesson, brothers and sisters, and apply it to us today because it really helps us in our family situations, our family matters, and help us to overcome so that we can all be saved when Jesus comes. All right? Thank you. Now we're going to hear from Sister Jasmine with the admission story. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. This morning, our mission story is entitled A Reason to Live and comes from Angola, Africa. Grassa Moon was born and raised in a Christian family, but never liked to go to church in Angola. As a small boy, he did everything possible to avoid attending religious classes meant to prepare him for baptism. As a preteen, he fell in love with rock music and copied the clothing and lifestyle of rock musicians. At the same time, he became fascinated with satanic symbols and associated the symbols with superiority and rebellion and drew them all over his body. In high school, his best friend was goth and he adopted a gothic lifestyle, wearing black clothes and painting his fingernails black. His friend also loved rock music and decorated his bedroom with rock music posters and satanic symbols. Soon, Grasa got into alcohol and marijuana. He advocated atheism and openly declared that Jesus was a myth. As a teen, Grassa started playing rock music and met a fellow musician who claimed to have made a pact with the devil. 
He liked the idea, so one night he told Satan that he could have his soul in exchange for musical success. But then his life fell apart. His mother abruptly died and his father an alcoholic drank even more. As the oldest of his four brothers, responsibility fell on him to care for the family. He felt like he was suffocating under a load of impossible problems. Amid this crisis, Grasa made a promise to himself to never drink or smoke again. He began to pray to God and he left the music scene. Grasa began to date a woman who introduced him to the Seventh-day Adventist church and they attended Sabbath worship services. After they broke up, he reconnected with old friends and quickly returned to his old habits. However, he wasn't happy. Many nights he fell asleep drunk or high on marijuana. Thoughts of suicide filled his head. Life seemed aimless and meaningless. In anguish, Grasa wept. He remembered God and prayed for help. He felt like he was dying and had only a few days left to live. He told his new girlfriend about his distress and she mentioned his name to a cousin who was a psychologist who had become an Adventist while studying abroad. Meeting with Grasa for counseling, the cousin told him to build his life on God alone and explained how to do it. Grasa resolved to put God first in his life and he started to develop healthy practices. He made it a habit to pray before making any decision and to seek only the will of God. As prayer became a regular part of his life, he gained the courage to dream again. He found a reason to live. Grasa decided to return to his church. The moment he stepped into the church, he longed to get baptized. When the service ended, he immediately enrolled in baptismal class. Unlike when he was a small boy, he now wanted to learn the meaning of baptism and to prepare for it. The reality of Jesus' love for him only increased his desire to give his heart to God through baptism. Today, Grasa can say that he is finally free. He savors the true peace and incredible joy he found in Christ. He finally has a purpose and responsibility in his life to bring souls to our Savior and Creator. May the deacons please come forward to collect the offering. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help open a Seventh-day Adventist school in Grasa's hometown of Luanda, Angola. So thank you for your generous offering. Please bow your head for prayer. Father, do I pray? No. Okay. Father God, thank you so much for bringing us all here this morning, Lord. We thank you for your blessings. We ask that you please bless each of us so that we can be able to give to you to continue the work that you're doing around the world, Lord. I ask for the, I ask a special prayer for those who are in areas where, where they may not be exposed to your love and to your word, God, that they may get the opportunity to learn more about you and gain an education through you, O Lord. We thank you for all that you do for us, and we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Cover of special music by Kayla.
Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. Today I'll be singing It Is Well With My Soul. guys are having a blessed sabbath so far in closing i'm going to read something from ellen g white a shepherd boy tending his father's flocks joseph's pure and simple life had favored the development of both physical and mental power by communication with god through nature and the study of the great truths handed down as a sacred trust from father to son he had gained strength and mind of firmness of principle in the crisis of, in the crisis of his life when making that terrible journey from his childhood, from home in Canaan to the bondage in which awaited him in Egypt, looking for the last time on the hills that hid the tents of his kindred, Joseph remembered his father's God. He remembered the lessons of his childhood and his soul thrilled with the resolve to prove himself true, ever to act as became a subject of the king of heaven. It is always a great blessing for someone to know their calling early in life. We can enjoy a profound sense of purpose and start working toward it, letting God lead. So when God opens the door, let us consider it a privilege to walk through it, no matter where, what, and who you are. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything I've done for us. Lord, please forgive us for our sins and help us to do the right thing, Lord. Help us to witness to other people and to share your word. Help us to become better Christians, Lord and learn throughout these biblical lessons, Lord. Thank you for everything you've done for us. Help us to have a blessed Sabbath. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.
Now we'll have our ministry moment. Good morning, happy Sabbath, everyone. Ministry moment. This is men's ministry. It's taking over for the next 10 minutes. Um, Ramel? Who is that? Okay, so men's ministry. Uh, men's ministry is an intentional attempt to bring men to God so that we can work our way to God's eternal kingdom. Men's ministry. Mission statement is to galvanize the energy and resources of men for God, for family, for church, and community. And may I say that um, um, there are times when we are not as galvanized and together as, as, as we should or as we could. But I have to say that over the course of time, over the course of time, things have gotten, especially in this church, things have gotten much better. Much better. Um, so a couple of things have um, caused that to happen. One was our uh, men's ministry convention that was held up in Camp Kalakwa. Um, it was the first time I believe that a group, since I've been here, a group such as this has been um, committed to going. and. Uh, I must say the trip was very fruitful. Um, planning of it was a bit challenging because of people's work schedules and things of that nature. But we had a group of people that were very committed. Um, and so we left here and together and we arrived at Camp Kalakwa. And I'm just gonna show you some pictures of you know, what took place basically. Got a bunch of people who we, we say we know each other, we come to church and we, you know, happy Sabbath and happy Sabbath, but you really don't really know a person. Trust me, you really don't really know a person until you're in a room with them, close quarters, and they may or may not be snoring in your ear. That's, gets in, intimate at that point. All right? So this gentleman right here, this is, this is did I do that? I, I don't know these people. Um, so we, we got to know each other very well on the trip up. There was some a lively discussion about the things that we saw along the way. Um, Gilbert was very tickled uh, about some of the events. He was very happy to be there. Um, and I was going to have him say a word about his experience, but since they only gave me 10 minutes, um, we're just going to run through a few things. So that's Gilbert. Um, that's Brother D and Brother Emmanuel having a um, uh, breakfast meal. Um, I was noticing that there was a there was a um, glove on Brother Emmanuel's hands, and that was because of uh, the continued need to uh, practice safe sanitation in eating establishments. So we had to get the food with gloves on our hands. I think he liked the gloves and he just wanted to keep them, so he just kept them on his hand. Um, brother, uh, our first elder there, Elder Nate, uh, he does not like to take pictures and he was trying his best to get out of the shot. <laughs> he wasn't fast enough. Um, so he was having a good time. And um, as you can see, it was a wonderful time. So, so what, was the point of, what was the point of all this? Well, let me, let me throw, show you some more pictures. I'll just let the pictures talk for themselves. Um, uh, Brother Gilbert again. For some reason he thought that he, he had a spot on the, um, on the program. And so when there was a vacant position, he got up and thought he would take over and preach. The mic was turned off, by the way. Um, and there are those say, unsavory looking people from Pompano Beach SDA Church. Um, oh yes. And so, that, that, that feeling of togetherness that we had, that, that, that communal uh, aspect that was generated as a result of uh, attendance at uh, the convention spilled over. And that feeling, that, that, that fire that was still burning in us was there. And so when it came to our organization of the women's, um, uh, what do you call that there? Mother's Day? Yes. 
For those of you in um, leadership positions, you know how difficult at times it is to get people to do things, right? Um, and to get everybody involved. So on this particular Sabbath, I just said, okay guys, we're gonna have a men's ministry meeting and we're gonna talk about what we're gonna do for uh, uh, Mother's Day. And uh, quite a few people showed up. Quite a few people showed up. And then we said, okay, well, who's gonna do what? And it was amazing that you know, folks' hands started going up saying, oh, I'll do this, I'll do that, and I'll do that. And I'm like, okay, all right. Yeah, okay, you say you're going to do this, but when it comes time to the real nitty-gritty, are you really going to show up? Are you really going to bring what you say you're going to bring? So I was a bit skeptical, um, but I took it on faith that they're going to do what they say they were going to do. So when Mother's Day came around and we had our, 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 um, our luncheon, lo and behold, we had a bevy of things that was brought in by our people that committed to doing so. And um, as you can see, on that particular day, I was on the platform. I had to do a lot of different things, so I wasn't able to, to be hands-on. And so Brother Stubbs and Brother Nate, they were back there while we were in here, um, working in the background and getting things together. And so. Uh, as you can see, things were going good. Um, yeah, this is one of my favorite. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is one of my favorite pictures. You got guys back there that are, you know, got their knee, you know, their elbows deep in, in work, getting the, the food together, and they're doing it with joy. And that's how we should operate. That's how we should operate. Anytime we have a, a, an assignment to do. You know, there shouldn't be any issues about, well, who's going to do what, who's going to be the leader, who's going to be the follower, our follower. Um, there's no leaders or followers, as you can see. Everyone's just doing stuff. And so I think by now we should all realize that there's a difference between men and women. There is a difference, a dis there's a lot of distinct differences between men and women. And one of the differences in how we interact with each other is a sort of a, um, we don't have that same kind of communal um, interrelationships that women have. So in order to get us to that point where we're communicating one-on-one, -on -one, we have to be doing things. We have to get involved and do things. We are doers. And so when we do things, we, 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 have, we, get, we have an opportunity to to uh, come together. Okay. So one of the things that um, we're looking at doing uh, upcoming shortly is having a men's ministry, ministry um, a breakfast, men's breakfast. That's on the way. Um, also, I got something from the conference. Uh, there's a cruise. Um, it is around Thanksgiving. I think it's the week, week before Thanksgiving, the cruise. A seven-day cruise. I'm going to post this up in the lobby. It is uh, going from Miami to Bahamas to Puerto Rico to St. Martin and back to Miami seven days. And the rates are pretty reasonable. Um, you'll get a chance to take a look at that in the lobby. And uh, we've got a few months to decide on what, whether you will attend. So men's ministry. We come together to be together to do God's work. It is important that we, that we understand that we have different needs, different um, motivations. And when we come together, there's a times that we have these little workshops where we address issues that are distinctly male. So anyone that's above the age of, I'm looking around, uh, let's say 12, 13, 14, uh, when we announce that there is a men's ministry meeting going on, you're welcome to attend. Because you can learn, young folks, you can learn um, valuable lessons from the older folks that are around the church. And we have different conversations that are uniquely male. And it's very good to hear some of these conversations. So I welcome and, and, and I encourage you to attend. Um, so I'll end on this note. Men must be men. 
men must be men. Men must assume roles and responsibilities that are distinctly men. Men are by nature leaders. Lead in every way or facet of your life. Church, at home, school, on the job, or even driving in your car. We call on all men to be leaders. Not just leaders sometimes, but leaders all the time. Every day we wake up and we move about, there's a lesson to be learned. God always gives us opportunities to learn something new every day. So um, I encourage you to learn from life's lessons and um, share those things when we come together. And on that note, let's say a word of prayer and bring up the next um, program. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to be here this morning, uh, this glorious Sabbath day. Uh, thank you for men's ministry and the leadership that's even from the conference all the way down to our local church here. Uh, thank you for the galvanization that's been taking place. Thank you for the leadership of our pastor and our, 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 our elders, the first elder, and, and those who support us and continue to support us, our wives, our children, our church members. And may we continue, Lord, to learn and grow as we serve you on a daily basis. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church, and happy Sabbath. This is the time for our welcome and announcement. At this time, I want to welcome all the members and all the uh, guests that we have with us today. Uh, if you're here for the first time or returning, could you please stand so we can acknowledge you? It's a wonderful Sabbath. We're happy to have you. And whether you're with us here physically or online, we hope that God's blessing will be on you today. Uh, we're going to start with some pastoral announcement at this time with Pastor Verse. Thank you, Sister Juna. Are you praising the Lord today? Amen. Amen. This, is, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we want to rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. 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 We'd like to uh, share with you some announcements, uh, some good things that's uh, happening. Um, and uh, we have a pretty full calendar that's coming next couple of months. Right, Lynn? We sure do. Amen. Amen. And so we want to let have you refer to the back of your bulletin. Uh, we have a couple of announcements we want to make you aware of. Today, we would like to ask our lay Bible ministers and uh, people who uh, are interested. Uh, we have been sharing with you about the third Sabbath uh, that we're going to use that as evangelism Sabbath, amen? And so we've been in planning and we've been in training and the devil tried to give us a black eye, but we're going to go on. Amen? Amen. And so uh, we're going to meet for uh, just a little while right after. I want to talk about next week because next week is the third Sabbath. And uh, we have some things coming up. Uh, we're going to be going out into the neighborhood and utilizing that training that we did for LBM. And we're also going to be promoting some of the programs that will be uh, held uh, the next couple of months. Now, one of the programs is Vacation Bible School. And so, Lynn, could you tell us a little bit about Vacation Bible School? Good morning. I just would like to share uh, my heart. And um, Vacation Bible School is an opportunity. We can go out into the community and reach our community for Christ. And it's a wonderful opportunity because children are our future. And so with that, uh, with that being said, Vacation Bible School is the perfect place for us to share the love of Jesus with kids. And so we're gonna need each one of you to help with Vacation Bible School. It's a week-long opportunity. It's gonna be July 18th 
through the 22nd. And leading up to that, on the 17th, there's going to be a work bee, so um, we're going to get the church ready. Then we're going to uh, go out into the community two or three weeks before that. We've got some little Bible cards that we are going to go, and we, are, we want you to take some, and we want you to share with your friends. We're going to have a sign up front. We're going to get a Facebook page inviting people to our church. But this is a perfect opportunity for each one of us to touch people in our community. Now, there is a little housekeeping. If you would like to volunteer and you're above the age of 18, if you would just go to the back when you have a moment and sign up, and then you just have to fill out the form online to be a volunteer so everybody is safe within you know, the boundaries of working with children. And then when Vacation Bible is, School is done, the 18th to the 22nd, we're gonna have a fellowship meal and we're gonna be inviting all of the families and there's gonna be like a mini graduation where we'll be giving them their little VBS diploma and their little awards that they've gotten through the week. So I just wanna share Pompano, you, you reach out all at the time and you're always there to help and we love each one of you and just wanna thank you in advance for helping with Vacation Bible School. Okay, so then how, how are we going to reach our community to let them know about VBS? Uh, the First Lady mentioned about Facebook and about the social media, but we're going to be having direct contact with our neighbors here in Pompano. And that direct contact will start next week. We are going to be taking the uh, journey through the Bible. This is a Bible um, study plan for children. We're going to be uh, giving this to the children, and we're also going to be giving them an invitation to the Vacation Bible School. Now, we're also going to be giving people our promotional card, letting them know about the Pompano Beach Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we're also going to be giving them the opportunity, should the Lord provide the, the uh, right conditions, to study the Bible. Now, those of you who are lay Bible ministers in training, you recognize this. We are going to be uh, carrying with us Bibles and the first Bible guide. And so if people should respond at the door, we're going to invite them to study the scripture. Now, we're going to follow the Bible admonition. We're gonna go out two by two and we're going to uh, go to the door and we're going to invite people to do that. And so I'll be sharing more of those details, what the logistics will be like uh, right after the service today. So we want everyone to attend. Now let's say, well, you may say, well, I'm shy and I can't talk to people, but you can be a praying partner, amen? How many people here know how to pray? How many people talk to God each day? Okay, great, just about everybody. And so if you're shy and you feel reserved, that's okay, uh, the Lord can use you. We need praying partners to go, to go with us. And your pastor's not gonna give you the assignment and then go away. Your pastor's gonna be right there with you and the elders are gonna be right there with you, amen? So everybody's gonna, gonna do the work and then we're going to invite them to our VBS program. And so uh, please come uh, right after the service. We'll share with you some of those details and we will have materials ready for you. Now next week is what? Father's Day weekend. It's Father's Day weekend. And so we are going to have a special fellowship dinner next week. And um, we want to thank uh, the people uh, uh, that have worked so hard. We want to thank our hospitality team. And we want to thank our women's ministry. Amen? Amen. We're going to have a good, we're going to have a good Sabbath together. And then after that, we're going to be all pumped up and fired up and we're going to go out. Amen? Amen. So don't, don't plan to get sick next week. Just kidding. Uh, this is what we've trained for. We've worked for over a year. And this is the time 
uh, that God has set for us to reach our community. Because this is one of the major reasons for being a Christian. I want people to know how happy I am in Jesus. Amen? Amen. And so in order to do that, we have to reach them. And so please plan to be here this afternoon and then next week after the fellowship dinner. Now, also, there's going to be an elders meeting uh, tomorrow, and uh, we will be sharing with you. And uh, we want to say how much we appreciate each one that's going to volunteer to help us with VBS as well. Amen. May God bless you as we move forward in reaching our community. Amen. The pastor and the first lady went over pretty much everything, so just a few one and a quick recap. Um, after church, uh, after divine worship today, there's gonna be a woman ministry committee meeting. It's gonna be a quick one, so just find Sister Elizabeth so you guys can uh, meet together right after divine worship. Prayer meeting uh, every Wednesday, 7 p.m. We continue to encourage you to come and be blessed. AY is gonna be at 6 p.m. today and it will be on Zoom. The ID is in the bulletin. Also, the AY department is uh, beginning a youth uh, Bible study. It's going to start on June 17, 2022 at 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. And everybody can participate. And the Zoom ID is going to be the same as the AY department ID, the one they use for AY on Sabbath afternoon. Also, ladies, remember that um, you need to uh, give your contribution so we can make uh, the, Father, the Father's Day special meal. So you can put it in the uh, tight envelope, just mark you know, Father's Day contribution so uh, we can make a, a wonderful you know, day for them next week. Um, as you know, we're planning you know, a special fellowship meal to celebrate all the fathers of the church. Also, if you part of divine worship at this time, we ask that you, you know, go around the back so we can uh, prep for divine worship. On June the 25th, which is in two weeks from today, will be Education and Fastest Day, and the speaker is going to be the principal of Southwest Adventist School, Pastor Robert Stevenson. So there's going to be also a fellowship meal on that day after divine worship. You can invite, you know, friends and family to be part of this program. Also, everyone graduating this year, 2022, from kindergarten through university, please submit, submit your name to uh, Brother Powell or Victoria Serafin by June uh, 18, by next week, so we can plan the program and make a nice education program on June the 25th. And also, they already uh, went over VBS, so I'm just going to remind you of the date. Yeah, it's going to be from July 18 to July the 22nd, and we need a lot of volunteers, so please uh, see Sister Victoria, see Sister Lynn, uh, so you guys can sign up and participate in uh, upcoming VBS July 18 to July the 22nd. Very important also is the work bee coming up on July 17, starting at 8 a.m., so everybody is invited, whether you're just visiting, friends, family members, so come out that day, July 17 at 8 a.m. so we can continue to maintain the church uh, property. Uh, also, if you're experiencing any religious discrimination, there's information in the bulletin for you to uh, reach out to, phone number, email, so you can uh, know exactly you know, your right and what can be done for you if you have any issues in that area. Again, we welcome everyone, and we hope that you're going to have a wonderful Sabbath. At this time, we're going to make room for the song leaders.
morning again and happy Sabbath. Sabbath. So we're going to start our song service. We're going to read, we're going to um, start with song 470. There's sunshine in my soul today. Number Selection is number four six six. Wonderful piece four six six six.
next selection will be number 245, More About Jesus, 245. in our worship by singing Holy Ground.
Father in heaven, we come to you this morning giving you praise and honor and glory. Amen. We praise you as creator. We praise you as sustainer. We praise you as recreator. Thank you, Lord. You have given us the new birth. So, Lord, we come to worship you this morning. We invite your divine presence by your Holy Spirit. So bless us, Lord, as we worship you in spirit and in truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll open our hymnals. Our opening song is number 272. Give me the Bible, 272. morning, church. Today's scripture reading will be taken from Job 14, 1 through 12, and it reads, Man that is born of a woman is of few days and full of trouble. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. And doth thou open thine eyes upon such a one, and brightest me into judgment with thee. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. Seeing his days are appointed, his bounds that he cannot pass. Turn from him that he may rest till he, till he shall accomplish, as in hairling his day. For there is hope of a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that the tender branch thereof will not cease. 
through the root whereof racks old in the earth, and the stock thereof die in the ground. Yet through the scent of water it will bud, and bring forth bows like a plant. But man dieth, and wasteth away. Ye man give up the ghost, and where is he? As the waters fail from the sea, and the floodeth decayeth, and dry upeth, so man lieth down, and riseth not, till the heavens be no more, they shall not awake, nor be arise out of their sleep. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. Uh, you may be seated. Last week, Brother Mike, during his uh, interesting prayer, he brought up how you know, the mass shootings have accelerated. And we know where this is coming from, but I just want to read something before I pray. It says, the days in which we live are solemn and important. The spirit of God is being gradually but surely withdrawn from the earth. Plagues and judgments are already falling upon the despisers of grace of God. The calamities by land and sea, the unsettled state of society, the alarms of war and potentials, they forecast approaching events of the greatest magnitude. The agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating. They are strengthening for the last great crisis. Great changes are soon to take place in our world and the final movements will be rapid ones. Fearful tests and trials await the people of God. The spirit of war is stirring the nations from one end of the earth to the other. The judgments of God are in the land. The wars and rumors of wars, the destruction by fire and flood say clearly that the time of trouble, which is to increase until the end, is very near at hand. We have no time to lose. The world is stirred again in the spirit of war. Soon, strife among the nations will break out with an intensity that we do not now anticipate. The present is a time of overwhelming interest to all living, rulers, statesmen, men who occupy positions of trust and authority, thinking men and women of all classes have their attention fixed upon the events taking place about us. They are watching the strained, restless relations that exist among the nations. They observe the intensity that is taking possession of every earthly element, and they realize that something great and decisive is about to take place the world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis. And brothers and sisters, we need Jesus today. Amen. But there's another war that's in our bodies, warring within our limbs called sin that we have to get rid of, brothers and sisters. Jesus will take care of the part I just read. But we need to take care of the sin problem before these things start happening and escalate at a magnitude that we can't even anticipate. So I ask you now, come down with a prayerful heart to the front so that we can pray together and ask the Lord to be with us and to uh, help us to overcome these sins in our lives through the Holy Spirit. So you can come on down to the front. Father in heaven, first of all, we'd like to thank you for giving us the breath of life, for waking us up this morning in our right minds. 
We thank you for your mercies and watch care bringing us through the week. Some of us had hard weeks, a hard week. Some of us lost our jobs, Father. Some of us were sick. But we know that you're the great giver, Lord, the great healer. Help us to have faith and trust in you, Father, and know that no matter what happens, you will provide. Jehovah Jireh. Lord, we pray for those that's here today. We pray for the sick. We pray for the, uh, those who, who are having family problems, those who are having financial problems. You know every heart in this place, Lord. And we pray that you be with each family, each person, children that's in college. Be with them, Lord. Help them to know that you're there with them. We thank you for being the great God, Father. There's no other God like you. We are privileged to know the true living God. Lord, we see what's going on in the world today. All kind of nonsense. The devil had this world upside down. People are running to and fro. Don't know where to turn. There's no answers in politics. There's no answers in schools. There's no answers anywhere. But we do know that Jesus is the answer. And Lord, we pray that we may turn from our sins. The ones that we know of and the ones that we commit that we don't know, bring it to light, Father. Time is wrapping up and we have to be found with no sin. The Spirit of Prophecy says that when Jesus uh, leaves the most holy place, that God needs to see little Jesuses all around the world, his character. And Lord, we know that time is near. So please help us to make a conscious effort to rid these sins out of our lives. Lord, if, there's, if we have malice against anybody, help us to go make up, Father. If we haven't talked to our children in years, help us to call them, Father. If we have children that left the faith, we pray for them, Lord, and help us as parents to say the right words, if there are any words, to bring them back. Because now is the time. Lord, we, 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 we live every day, try to live according to your word. But we need a double portion of your Holy Spirit, Lord. The devil is throwing everything he can at us. And some of us feel like we're on the verge of giving up. Give us that extra strength to hold on to the end. For he who endureth in the end will be saved, Lord. That's what you said. Uh, be with us, Lord. We ask as the pastor comes today to bring the bread of life, Lord, that you may fill his lips with words of encouragement, something that applies to us today as your people to help us to get through these times, something to give us hope, something that will, will, will rid our lives of sin, Lord. We pray for these things, Lord. You promised that you would help us. We cannot do it alone. So we ask that you be with us. Forgive us all for our sins and our unrighteousness. Cleanse every soul, every mind right now, Father, so that when we leave this place, we may, a new, be, we may be a new mind in Christ. Be with us, Lord, as we worship you in spirit and in truth. Bless us, be with us, be with our families. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 This is now 
the moment when we worship the Lord with our tithes and offerings. I'll read something for you. The stewardship of money involves God's claim upon our finances. Let us inquire, what shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? The spirit of giving is the spirit of heaven. There are three kinds of givers. The flint, the sponge, and the honeycomb. You must hammer the fly to get the chips and sparks only. You must squeeze the sponge to get water, but the honeycomb just overflows with its own sweetness. Let us determine not to be like the flint, stingy and hard, not like the sponge, which means which must be pressed to give. We ought to be like the honeycomb. For the Bible says, God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. And the stories told of those individuals who were in the temple, uh, taken from Luke 21, first three verses I read. While Jesus was in the temple, he watched the rich people dropping their gifts in the collection box. Then a poor widow came by and dropped in two coins, two small coins, I should say. Then Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the rest of them, for they have given a tiny part of their surplus. But the, she, the poor, has given everything she has. This morning, let us worship the Lord in giving our best, not just our finances, but our hearts to the Lord. At this time, our deacon and deaconesses will wait on us for the morning's tithes and offerings.
Let us pray. Our Father, we come to you this morning with gratitude of hearts to thank you for the opportunity that you have given us health and strength where we can go toil and make uh, what we need to make for our families, our lives, and for others. We thank you for the returns that you have given to us. We pray now, Lord, that you'll bless these offerings, help that they will go toward uh, the benefit of spreading the gospel, of uh, taking care of all those things that are needed uh, for your glory and for your kingdom. We ask that you'll bless those who have given and those who did not have to give, but they have given their hearts uh, unreservedly to you. We pray that you'll bless us all and keep us and help that we we'll continue to worship you this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. God bless. All right, now we will have the children's story by Sister uh, Kayla D.A. So if the children will come up to the front, uh, my left and your right sit in the front here, and they begin by Sister D.A. Sabbath kids. So before we begin, does anyone want to pray for me, please? Christopher, you want to pray? Uh, dear Lord, please help us learn more about you today. Please let the children learn about you and please bless the children's story today. Please bless the service, the sermon that's going to happen. Um, in a minute, and please keep us safe. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. So, have you guys ever felt wrong before? Maybe a kid said something, at your, said something mean to you at your school, or maybe your sibling got you in trouble? Well, something similar happened to a boy named Joseph in the Bible. His brothers had sold Joseph into slavery because they hated and were jealous of him. So I want you guys to watch this video to see how God took this unfortunate situation and used it for good, and how Joseph remained faithful the whole time. The Faithful Hall of Fame, Joseph. This is Joseph, hey. who was the son of Israel and Rachel. Ah. He was his father's favorite, so his brothers hated him oh. and sold him into slavery. Yeep. You see, Joseph was taken to Egypt, Ooh. and Potiphar, one of the Pharaoh's officials, bought him for his household. God was with Joseph, and he did well in Potiphar's house. Oh! Potiphar saw that God made everything Joseph did a success. Aha! So he put Joseph in charge of his whole house. Yeah! And God blessed Potiphar's house because of this. Potiphar's wife saw how well Joseph was doing in the house, and she wanted to make him do bad things. Joseph ran away from her because he wanted nothing to do with someone who would try to make him do the wrong thing. This made Potiphar's wife angry, and she wanted to be rid of Joseph. So she lied and made Potiphar believe that Joseph had done the bad things that she wanted him to do. Potiphar burned with anger against Joseph and sent him to prison. Uh. 
while Joseph was in prison. Again, he did well and the warden soon made him responsible for all that was done there. God was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. When two full years had passed, Pharaoh was having unsettling dreams. Pharaoh did not understand his dreams, so he sent for Joseph. Hey. Pharaoh asked Joseph to tell him the meaning of his dreams. With God's help, Joseph told Pharaoh that the dreams told of what could come in the future, and he explained all the dreams to the Pharaoh. Pharaoh believed that what Joseph was saying was true. He trusted Joseph as a wise man. And he put him in charge of the land of Egypt, of Pharaoh's palace, and of all his people. You guys can now collect the offering. Okay, so before we pray and go back to our seats, I want to leave you with this one last verse from Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is in his day to save many people alive. So, Ben, ben do you like to pray for me? <laughs> Can we please close our eyes and bow our heads for prayer? Dear God, thank you for this day. Please bless us as we're ending our children's story. Please help us to, to be as faithful as um, Joseph did. And please help us to help everyone around us and spread the word of God. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. You may now go back to your seats. Today we're privileged and happy to have our very own pastor again coming to bring us the word of God. Uh, by the title, it looked like it's going to be another good one called Grave Errors. Grave Errors. 
But before he comes uh, to give us the word, we, we're going to be blessed by the song of meditation by Sister Madeline and Tiana St. Jean. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sorry, is our internet connection. (sighs) 
His heart was broken, my was mended. He became thin, now I am clean. The cross he carried, oh my brother. The nails that set him, set me free. His life for mine, his life for mine. How could it ever be that he will die? God's son will die to see. Suffering brought me healing. He spilled his blood to fill my soul. His crown of thorns made me royalty. His soul gave me joy. Amen. Thank you, dear sister. What a blessing. Amen. Yes. Praising the Lord. You praising the Lord today? Man, I'm praising the Lord. I'm alive. Amen. You're alive today? Amen. Man, I'm not dead. I'm alive. Yes. And even more, the Savior's alive. Yes. But we're going to talk about death. Today, the title of the message is Grave Errors. And um, this message was chosen uh, because we looked at life's questions, remember? The four major questions. And uh, when we looked at um, 
the issue of Psalm 37. I promised you that we would be looking at the last question, and that is the question of what happens when a man or woman dies. And so the next two messages, we're going to deal with this topic. Now, this topic is sensitive. Now, there are, there are two major teachings in the Seventh-day Adventist Church that people many times will quit attending evangelistic series. They will quit studying the Bible because of these two things. Now, you would think that the teaching of the Seventh-day Sabbath would be a major one, right? It is, but the two major teachings that people uh, stop studying the Bible is, number one, adornment. People want to continue to decorate their bodies. And then number two is the issue of death. Because it's so personal to people, and uh, people many times wrap their lives around this error that some people cannot let it go. And so the next two weeks, we're going to look at this issue of death. And the wonderful thing about it is that it's a joyous message, amen? And God wants us to know that he cares about us. And he cares about our loved ones that we have lost. Now, a young man was traveling and walking through a graveyard. And he came upon this epitaph. Before we read that epitaph, I'd like us to take a moment and pray together. Father, we come to you asking you that only your spirit would be here. Lord, we ask that any demonic spirits, any spirit of dissatisfaction, any lying spirits, any spirits of mediums or demons or anything would be pushed away by the power and blood of Christ. And as we look at this topic, help us, Lord. Send your Holy Spirit to help things to be clear so that we will not be deceived, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The young man read this. Remember, dear friends, as you pass by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, you soon will be, so prepare yourself to follow me. The little boy sat down by this gravestone and he thought for a minute. And he came up with the following response, which goes like this. To follow you, I'm not content until I know just where you went. People are asking. This is one of the major questions, according to the major polls we talked about last time together. Can we know the state of man and death? I believe we can. And I believe there are answers found in the Bible. And the devil has used death extensively. The devil has brought about teachings that are not biblical. The devil has brought about philosophical framework that is not 
biblical. And so therefore, we need to understand what is the Bible telling us about death. There are warnings for us. See, the idea of talking to the dead or communicating with the dead seems to fascinate many today. If you look at Hollywood, for example, the, the death is a constant theme. You see apocalyptic zombies. You see spirit mediums. You see all of these things happening within our world. You can't hardly go down the street and, unless you see a psychic reader sign inviting you in. Movies, novels, even children's literature like Harry Potter and some of the others focus on the dark side and death because people are fascinated. So we want to know what the Bible teaches and the spirit of prophecy teaches us concerning this issue of death. See, the psychics and mediums and people who communicate with supposedly the souls of the dead is big business. Lots of money is involved, but what is the state of man and death. We are given warnings in the Bible, and we are also given warnings in the spirit of prophecy. I'd like to read with you from Great Controversy, page 588. Through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond and sympathy with Rome. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp the hands with the Roman power. And under the influence of this threefold union, the country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. So we see the issue of death and how people interpret death is one of the major deceptions of the last days. And so we need to understand. Now, what does the Bible teach us concerning this? See, this is an important question. And how can we know for absolute certainty that these communications and movies and novels are false or extremely dangerous. See, our eternal salvation is at risk here. So we need to get solid answers. And I believe those answers are found in the Scripture. And the Scripture, like the spirit of prophecy, gives us warnings. Leviticus 19.31 says this, Give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Mediums are people who claim to be able to communicate with spirits, and familiar spirits are the manifestations themselves. Notice the Bible says, Do not seek after them to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. So God gives us warnings about the apocalyptic zombies and all the things we see coming across our television every single night. 
warns us about witches and all of these other things. See, the Bible is unequivocally clear. Do not try to communicate with the dead. This is not what we should do. I have a friend of mine uh, who is a pastor, and we work together in New York City. And he did canvassing work in Australia. And he discovered something. He went to the houses on one street, and he found four people that said that they were communicating with dead relatives. Spiritualistic manifestations are exploding. The Bible warns us again, notice with me, Deuteronomy 18, verses 10 through 12, says this, There shall not be found among you a witch or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer. A necromancer is someone who claims to communicate with the dead. For all that do these things are what? An abomination unto the Lord. And so we see that the Bible is helping us to understand that these are dark satanic powers. Exodus 22:18 says this, you shall not permit a sorceress to live or a witch so we we see these things happening and in the old testament god did not allow it see people who consult with uh, familiar spirits or attempt to talk to the dead are an abomination to the lord and we find we find a Terrible example in Scripture. You remember when Saul, the Lord stopped talking to Saul, and Saul had rooted out most of the witches and all of these things that we see so prevalent today. And then when God would not talk with him, he went to a witch of Endor. And we're going to spend a little more time on this later. But I want you to notice what God said. This is 1 Chronicles 10, 13. So Saul died for his unfaithfulness, which he committed. And also because he consulted a medium for guidance. Now, none of us are running out to mediums and all of this, uh, these things that they purport to be tricks by carnies, but this is serious business. And so we want to understand what the Bible teaches. See, but why would God want to prevent us from communicating with the dead? Doesn't he understand our need for comfort and guidance? And uh, if you've lost a loved one, it's a terrible experience to go through. And it's really shameful that the devil takes advantage of this state in which people find themselves. And so the reality is, is that the Bible has comfort for us. See, God wants the very best for his people. See, his heart of love knows about death. He tells us in the New Testament that death is an enemy. And he sees if a sparrow falls to the ground, and he knows that we have lost our loved ones. But he also warns us that we need to be very careful because we live in a culture, we live in a world that does not walk with God. And so therefore, God cares about everything that concerns us, but God also wants us to know the truth. 
And the truth is a beautiful thing. Now, how does Jesus feel when we lose a loved one? The shortest verse in Scripture tells us. John eleven thirty five, At the death of Lazarus, when Jesus came, and he knew he was going to raise Lazarus. Amen? The Bible says that Jesus wept. Jesus knows when we lose a loved one. And he cares that we lose them. And God has given us a solution, amen? The Bible says this. He says, God will not withhold anything good from them that walk uprightly. So the psalmist tells us that God wants us to know that he cares about those who we have lost. And he wants us to know. And the fear and anxiety that comes in death, the Bible says this, Revelation 1.17, he says, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. Amen. So God gives us the promise that the dead will live again. Amen. Amen. And he will help us. He says, I have the keys of death and the grave. Continuing Revelation 1.18. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. Amen. So that enemy will come, but God promises a resurrection. John 10.10, 10, the Bible says this, and I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. That's what God wants us to know, amen? We can have life and we can have it more abundantly. And he even goes to further to say, John eleven twenty five. 25, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Amen. So death has no hold on anyone. God has promised that this will pass away. Because the last enemy that will be conquered will be death itself. John 1, 1 to 3 gives us this guarantee. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Notice with me, for by him all things were created. All things were created through him and for him. So God has control of everything, amen? And just like the other questions we looked at, why is there suffering? When will the wicked receive their reward? And what is my purpose? The word of God tells us the answer. See, for by him were all things created, everything. And death is that enemy that was brought about by disobedience that will be done away with by the creator of heaven. Again, Job tells us the state of man. As the cloud disappears and vanishes away, so he who goes down to the grave does not come up. So can our loved ones speak to us after death? No. And so we have to look and see what all these mediums 
and things are really about. Job 7, 9, and 10 says this, He shall never return to his house, nor shall his place know him anymore. And so therefore, when a, someone dies, and we're going to talk about the composition of people and the, and the place where people are when they die, but that person who is laid to sleep in the grave does not return. There's some other power at work. Ecclesiastes 9.5 says this, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. So the Bible is letting us know when someone dies, they sleep in the grave, and we'll look at that word sleep at a later time, how God describes it. So who is responsible for these manifestations? Notice with me Revelation 16, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> 13 and 14. And I saw three unclean spirits, or demons, like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons, fallen angels, performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth, and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So we see satanic manifestations being used in which to deceive the people of the earth. Hollywood and theater and the novels and all these things that we see, the horror flicks, the Halloween marathons, it's all from a satanic source. The Bible tells us so. And so the devil has a agenda. And so we need to understand that agenda. How did it start? Revelation 12, 7 through 9 puts it this way, and war broke out in where? Heaven. Michael or Jesus and his angels fought with who? The dragon And the dragon and his what? Angels fought, but they did not prevail for nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. And so we see the great controversy was started and then the devil began to lie to the people about who he really was. Continuing Revelation 12, 9, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast out to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So the Bible tells us that this great deceiver, Revelation 17, 9, continues, who deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So who is deceiving our loved ones? Who is pretending to come back from the dead? These are spirits of demons working so the Bible tells us not to do these things or to be involved with them. And I would say we should not even watch them on the movie screen. 
because there's potential to be deceived. That's not that loved one who is trying to communicate with us. It's the spirit of devils. But why would the devil want to comfort us? Why would the devil want to have our loved ones come to us? 2 Corinthians 11:14 tells us the reason. And no wonder for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. And so these wonders and these miracles that's done by satanic agencies at the end of time are going to be overwhelming and deceiving. See, Satan's using his deceptive power to bring the world into his control. So this is how mediums can put people in touch with the loved ones who have died. That's why they can look just like our loved ones. This happens. It happens every day. I have studied the Bible with people and uh, one lady told me, she says, my husband who died five years ago, every night he comes to me and he sits on the edge of the bed and then I drink my little nightcap and then I lay down and I go to sleep. This is happening. And we're going to look at some subtle forms as we go along. This is one of the major deceptions of the last days. And it's so strong that people stop studying the Bible because they would rather have these things happen than know the truth of the Word. The Word is under attack. And we need to understand what the battle is about. So what about this battle? Look with me. Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 and 5 says this. Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and will deceive many. Matthew 24, 23, and 20, <clears throat> excuse me, 23 to 25 puts it this way. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. So people would claim to be Christians. People would claim to be in Christ's name, the Christ consciousness, and comfort people through spiritualistic manifestations, through pagan demonstrations. We see it in false religion every day. Matthew 24, verse 25 says this, For false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders. So we can't necessarily believe our eyes. Continuing, Matthew 24, 25 says this, To deceive, if it was possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. See, we have been warned that these deceptions would come. Despite all these warnings, the Bible, that the Bible has, people still choose to believe what their hearts and senses are telling them. And the Christian church for the most part, teaches the lie of the immortality of the soul. 
So what about out-of-body experiences and all of that? What about the spiritualistic manifestations and the power that comes to people who are involved in these false manifestations? Well, the reality is, is that the Bible tells us to not do these things and that the devil would have great power not only in time, but especially in the last days. The deceptions are, will be so convincing that regular people, those who do not, do not make the word of God their stay, will be see, deceived. So, those involved in paganism and the New Age and the Christ consciousness and these other manifestations of demonic power are deceived. And we're told in the Bible that, that in the last days that there would be false teachings. One of the major teachings is the teachings of reincarnation. That people come back again and again and again. Have you heard of karma? Everybody's talking about karma. And everybody's talking about their past lives that they had. Buddhism, Shintoism, Taoism, these spiritualistic manifestations, yoga, we see it everywhere. Have you heard of Christian yoga? It's all around us. Oh, that's just an innocent exercise. Not really. Transcendental meditation, the use of drugs, and especially with marijuana today going into altered states of consciousness, drug-induced or otherwise, people going into a frenzy in, in Pentecostal churches, people speaking in tongues, all of these things we have been warned from the Bible. The Bible reminds us in John 10.10, 10, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So when God wants us to not do things, he does it for a reason. He wants to keep us from being deceived. See, because our sight is incomplete, 1 Corinthians 13, 12 puts it this way, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know as also I am known. And so the Bible comforts us, amen, in telling us that this is not all there is. And then eventually the Bible promises that those who have experienced death will have this blessed experience. Revelation 21, 1 to 4 says this, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had what? Passed away. It's all going to be gone. Amen? Amen. All of, all of these rotten movies and all of this nonsense and, and all of this spiritualism is going to be gone. Amen? Amen? You won't have to be tempted walking down the street. For a new heaven and a new earth is coming. Amen? Amen. See, Jesus conquered it all. And we can be overcomers just like him. Revelation 21.3 says this, Also there was no more sea, 
Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Amen. As a bride, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, notice with me, Revelation 21, 4, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now, I've got to stop here for just a minute. Those who have lost loved ones, this is the promise of the Scripture. Amen. Amen. God is going to take all of that away. Now, can I explain how? No. But I know it's going to happen. Because God's word can be trusted. Amen? Amen. And notice what he says, continuing Revelation 21, 4. He says, there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. For what? The former things are what? passed away. It's all going to be over. So hang on. <clears throat> First Peter 1, 3, and 4 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope, living through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So where is the solution coming from? Is it coming from the mediums? Is it coming from the poem readers? Is it coming from the Harry Potter? Is it coming from Twilight? No, it's coming from the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen! Amen! We can be happy. Continuing, he says this, to an inheritance incorruptible. Are things corrupt right now? Yes. And undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved for you where? In heaven. 1 John 5, 11 and 12 says this, and this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. Amen. And this life is in his Son. This life is in Jesus. Amen. Amen. And so, should we seek after demons and spirits that mutter and peep? Should not a people seek after their gods for answers concerning the dead? Continuing this, he says, he who has, the son has life. He who does not have the son does not have life. This is the promise of scripture. 1 John 5, 13, these things have I written to you who believe in the name of the son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Amen. Amen. Isn't eternal life enough? Amen. And he gives us the invitation every day, not like the devil does, lying and deceiving. He wants us to know that he wants us to be with him and to be his child. Revelation 3.20 puts it this way. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. And so, who has the power of the grave and death? the Lord Jesus Christ. And then one day he will burst, burst through the clouds. Amen? Amen? And he'll say, come, my people. 
enter into my everlasting kingdom. Rise, those who have died. Will we see mom and dad again? Amen. And so this is a message of comfort. This is a message that says that man sleeps in the grave until Jesus comes. So no one's seeing all this hassle you're going through down here. Amen? Amen. Blessed are they that die in the Lord. And so God wants us to know that we can have peace concerning our loved ones. And that the God of all the earth, the judge of all the earth, will do right. He considers whether we're born here or born there. Amen? The out, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And God knows the heart of everyone. And God will judge according to his righteous judgment. Amen. Now, what about this issue of people coming back from the dead? I'd like to share with you a personal story. This was one of the Bible teachings that was, that, um, was very difficult for me. And uh, I fought this one very heavily. And uh, I went to the library and I began to look at the history and all of this, some of the things I've already talked with you about. And I discovered what the Bible teaches about death. And I was lying in my bed one night, and a uh, friend of mine that was a boyfriend of, of my sister, and we were good friends. His name was Tim Byard. And he had been killed in an auto accident. And uh, he and I were uh, uh, pretty good friends as well as he was my sister's boyfriend. And I was uh, sleeping one night and then all of a sudden he appeared to me. And he looked just like Tim. And he began to talk to me about things. And when he began to talk to me, he was so real. I said, I just studied this. And the Bible says that this is not true. And I had a struggle. I want you to, to be honest. I had begun to study these things and I was in a state of flux because I hadn't determined in my mind what was total truth or not. And he continued to talk to me and then I thought in a, a, about the quote in Leviticus and Deuteronomy we just read at the beginning. And I said, this is a deception. And I said to that appearance, I said to him, you are not real. I rebuke you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And boom, he disappeared. The deceptions of the last days. Stay close to your Bibles. Stay close to your God. Hollywood and everybody else is pushing humanity into this spiritualistic phenomena that is taking over churches. The Seventh-day Adventist Church, as well as any other church, is challenged with these things. Spiritualism and people bringing uh, subtle teachings in from other churches that sometimes don't understand totally the picture. 
We're being hit with this, folks. And so we need to be very careful and understand and know what the Word of God teaches. Amen? Amen. We cannot go by our feelings and we cannot go by what other churches and other people teach. And our God, our God will come. Jesus Christ will crack the skies and he will come down through that corridor and he will give us the payment on the eternal life that we already have. Amen? Amen. And so maybe you're listening today. Now, maybe you're watching by the internet and you've struggled with these things. Please stay close. Stay in your Bibles. And please join us next time because we are going to look at the state of man in death. And we're going to further look at some of these deceptions that the devil is producing in the last days. And if you've lost a loved one, Go to God in prayer and ask him to give you the help and comfort that you need because he is an all-comforting God. He says, cast your cares upon me because I care for you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning in anticipation that you have promised that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And Lord, that you will help us to cope with the loss of our loved ones. Lord, we need your strength, we need your power, and we need your support. And Lord, help us to be aware of the devices of the enemy and not succumb to the culture of occultism in which we live. So, Lord, help us in these things. Bless us. And, Lord, help us always to remember that you're there and that we can call upon you because you do care for us. So, bless us to this end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you'll turn to our closing hymn, we will be singing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Him 462. Four six two, blessed assurance. Four six two.
that we bow our heads. But before we do that, just a reminder that the LBM, Lay Bible Ministry, we're going to meet in the small fellowship hall right quick, not too long. And then Sister Elizabeth, Women's Ministry, we're going to meet probably in here right after uh, service. All right? So we bow our heads. Father in heaven, I'd like to thank you once again for feeding us, Lord. We know that the devil has deceptions waiting on us. So help us to stay close to the Bible. Read, Father, and show us truth. Not only for ourselves, but that we may go warn others that the deceptions is coming, is here. So help us to stay close, Lord. Don't leave you for one minute. Don't go on emotions and thoughts and imagination, just what's written in the word of God. Be with us now as we leave this place. Continue to bless us over this Sabbath day, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.